Rub up your engines! Now sure, modern cars are complicated. And over the last 52 years, I've seen some really simple fixes that you can quickly do it yourself and not have to mess with the mechanic. Now the first one is rather straightforward. Let's say you're driving on the road and your brake light comes on. Now it could be a serious problem. It could be nothing. You could have a leak in the system. You could have a pressure loss where it goes down. Maybe the booster's going bad or the ABS system. You could have forgotten and left your emergency brake on, but you could just be low on brake fluid and check the brake fluid level. It should be up to the top line. In this case, it's low. So I'll add some until it gets to the line. Realize, inside that master cylinder reservoir, there's a float. When the float gets low, turns on the brake light. Usually it just means you're low on fluid. Sometimes the float itself breaks. And if you tap it and the light goes out, your float's starting to break, it's probably time to put a new one in. But if adding brake fluid turns the light off, then just watch your brake fluid, week or two or three, and if it's not losing any, that's fine. Because your level can go down for more reasons than just a leak. Of course, if it's leaking, it keeps going down, you gotta fix that leak. But as you drive, the brake pads wear, and as they wear, they push in, so the brake calipers that squeeze them go in further, and that takes up fluid. So just over time, the fluid level go down as the brake pads wear. And there's also a tiny amount of evaporation because it's a vented system. But normally, it's as your brake pads wear. So if your brake light comes on once every few years, hey, <laughs> just add the fluid. But of course, check your brake pads then too, if it's been years, because they might get real thin, and that you can look at physically. But a lot of times, just adding the fluid fixes it. And as long as it doesn't leak out fast, it's perfectly fine to drive it that way. If your brakes are hard and the only problem was the light was on, it's because things have worn and the fluid level goes down and you add a little up. Now, of course, that's not the case for radiators. Your radiator, hey, it should always be full. It does not lose over time. If it does, you got a problem. But the brake system, over years, it'll go down. So if every so many years your light comes on, you add fluid, it's totally normal. Now the next easy fix has to do with your EVAP system, the anti-pollution system in your car. If your check engine light comes on, you get a code like PO457. PO457, EVAP emission system leak detector. Now EVAP systems can get leaks in many places. Sometimes you gotta drop the gas tank to find it. But in this particular code, it's often either a loose or a missing gas cap, which you can easily replace yourself. As you can see, right on the inside here, there's a rubber seal. Guess what happens? The rubber seal goes bad over time. And check the lip. If it's dirty or corroded, you want to clean it off with a little carburetor spray. So if there's any crud, it'll get it off and it will seal correctly. Just realize gas caps wear out over time. And you gotta change them every once in a while. And my advice is, don't go online and buy the cheapest gas cap you can get your hands on. You're better with the OEM ones. They're made correctly, they have the correct pressure. I've seen it where people buy aftermarket gas cap at some discount auto parts store. They still have the code, they bring it to me. I go to the dealer and buy an OEM one. Guess what, the code goes away. And maybe you don't even need a cap. If it's not tight, turn it till it's tight and they click. When they click, they're tight and it won't leak. I can't remember how many times people either brought me a car that didn't have a gas cap or it wasn't on tight enough and it tripped that coat. You can easily check that stuff yourself and just either replace it or tighten it up. Now let's say your car isn't putting out much heat. Well, heater systems are pretty basic. A heater core, it's inside the dash, that takes the hot water from the engine, air blows through it, makes you hot, then it goes back into the engine, gets heated up, goes through the radiator, comes back, it's an endless cycle. But today, those things are all computer controlled. But there's still a very simple thing that often makes them not work right. And that is, the car is low on coolant. Now a heater car is just a miniature radiator. But generally, they're one of the highest points of the cooling system. So if you're low on coolant, what happens? The air rises to the top of the system. So if your heater core has air in it, instead of hot water, it won't work right. Now it might sound a little crazy because hey, the heater core would still be full of hot air, but the specific heat of air is so much lower than the water. You won't get hardly any heat when there's air in it instead of water. The heater core is a heat exchanger made for liquids, not for gases like air. So if your heater's not working right, or if it's just going weak, check your coolant. Fill it up to the top. 
Could be as simple as you're just low on coolant. Now, if you're low on coolant, then you want to check it out once a week at least to see if is there a leak or something you got to keep adding. Because I mean, some people they don't check the coolant ever. If the car is three, four years old, and you add a little in the heater, works great. Now, if it keeps going down, you got to find out what's wrong. But on the plus side, cars all have temperature gauges. If you have a serious cooling system leak or problem, you'll see the temperature gauge starts running warmer. Then you want to work on that. If you add coolant and you get heat and everything works fine for weeks or months, ah, don't worry about it. You fix it by just adding coolant. Now the next simple fix is perhaps the simplest of them all. I've had scores of customers bring me cars that failed the yearly emissions test, that didn't run right. And what was wrong? The only thing that was wrong was the air filter was clogged. The car burns thousands of cubic feet of air every day. The filter's dirty, hey, you're gonna have problems. Now I keep mine pretty clean, you see, this is the dirty side, that's the clean side. You can look at the sun with it, and if you can see through really clearly, you don't have any worries, it's clean. I had customers bring me cars that this was all black, filled with crud, it was amazing the car ran at all. Hey, the world's a dirty place and getting dirtier by the minute. Filters can clog up much faster than they used to. Find where your filter is. Check it every once in a while. And when it comes to replacing your filter, my advice, you best stick into the original equipment ones that came with. The cheap aftermarket ones, often, if you count the number of pleats, less of them. They don't filter as well. The material can be cheaper made. They're not all that expensive, even the original equipment one. You're much better doing that than you are buying the cheapest one you can that isn't going to work as good. When you consider the hundreds of thousands of cubic feet of air you're going to be burning and the thousands of gallons of gasoline you're going to be burning, you'd actually save money buying a more expensive filter if it works better than a cheap one that doesn't filter as well and you get less power, worse gas mileage. In the long run, buy a quality filter. Don't save pennies and lose dollars. Now here's a simple fix that really isn't a fix. It prevents you from having to do a very expensive fix and that's your gas gauge. Fill your car up, don't let it get all the way to the E. Good advice when you get down to about a quarter of a tank, refill it. And here's the reason why. All modern cars have electric fuel pumps. They hide inside the gas tank. What actually lubricates the fuel pump is gasoline. It may sound crazy, but yeah, liquid gasoline is somewhat of a lubricant. So the bearings of the pump are lubricated by gasoline flowing through them. So if you do actually run your car out of gasoline, the fuel pump will then suck air. Air does not lubricate the bearings. So you run out of gas and you actually have none in the tank, you keep cranking the engine, the fuel pump is pumping air, it will burn out the bearings ruin your very expensive fuel pump. Some cars you gotta drop the gas tank, it costs you over a thousand bucks to change out a fuel pump. Just making a point of, when you get a quarter or less, fill it back up. Don't just see how far you can go and then end up running out of gas. And now let's say you've been bad, you let it run out of gas. Look at that gauge, if it's way down E, don't keep cranking the engine to try to start it. That will burn the pump up. Let's say you're driving the car and you actually run out of gas, it stops running. If you look and see it's on E, just go get some gasoline and pour it in. Do not keep trying to start it, because starting it will burn that pump up. You don't want to do that. So if you really don't want to get involved in any of this nonsense in the first place, just keep it above a quarter of a tank all the time. Do like I do. Pretend that quarter of a tank is empty and when it gets near a quarter, fill it back up again. Now my last quick fix is a simple, easy to do one. Let's say you try to start your car. All you get is click, click, click. If you jump start it and it starts right up, odds are you just need a battery. Because let's face it, if your car doesn't start, you'll have a tow to a mechanic, you gotta pay for a very expensive tow. And there's a lot of dishonest mechanics out there who start trying to sell you all kinds of crap. The numero uno reason a car goes click is because the battery doesn't have enough power to go to the starter to start the car. And if it jump starts right up, Odds are you just need another battery. And related to this quick fix is another one. Let's say you jump start it, still just goes click, then get a hammer or a giant piece of wood and beat the starter as someone turns the key. If all of a sudden it starts, or at least it starts going wrong, wrong, tries to start, that means your starter's bad. Now, some cars like my Celica, starter's just sitting there out in the open. You can change it in 10 minutes. Some cars are a real pain, but at least You'll know what's wrong with the car if you're not going to fix it yourself. And if you are going to fix it yourself, hey, you're going to save yourself a ton of money. So now you know some easy quick fixes 
for very common car problems that you can do yourself in a flash and not have to waste any money and time paying somebody $100 an hour to do it for you. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Like a somebody says, Scotty, I have a 2014 Impreza Automatic. Do you recommend sticking to the factory transmission fluid or can I use a different one? Modern cars are so particular what kind of fluid is in it. You're best to stick to the factory fluid on all the modern cars. Now, ages ago when I was a young mechanic in the 1960s, there was like automatic transmission fluid that fit most cars and sometimes Ford had a special one just for Fords and that was it. But now there's a zillion different kinds. There's all kinds of different transmission designs, CVT, regular automatics, and they all come with a particular fluid that engineers design. I wouldn't go against the engineers on that one. So what if one you can get for three dollars a quart and the other one is seven? Hey, you're only using three or four quarts generally. You don't want to mix different things. Who knows what additives are in each one? If you got the factory one, it has exact additives additives it was designed for. You buy an aftermarket one, hey, it might be the same, might have slightly different additives. Don't mess with success. That's what I say when it comes to fluids in any modern vehicle because they become so ultra high level of technology. You don't want to mess with that by using some generic fluid that may or may not have the correct additives. Journey 19 says, Scotty, I got a 2000 Chrysler 2.4, 120,000 miles. Runs great, but my heat is only lukewarm. I've changed the fluids. I had a guy flush out the heater core, but it's still lukewarm. Hell, I work on enough of those things to tell you 99.999% of the time, that means you need a new heater core. Chrysler makes some of the worst heater cores in the world. And I mean, hey, it is a 2000. So the thing lasted for 20 years. I mean, you really can't gripe about that. But when you find out how much money it's going to cost, change that heater core because you could take the dash apart. You got to take all kinds of crap off to get to that heater core. The problem with heater core is heater cores have hot water, just like your car's radiator. But unlike the radiator, they don't have full flow. They only have a little bit of flow going through them. And as they age and corrode, they don't dissipate heat as well. And even though you said I got flushed it out, those things are so cheaply made that the flushing often doesn't help because the metal inside is just flat out corroded. It doesn't dissipate the heat anymore. Now, now that said, and if you find it's going to cost you seven, eight hundred bucks to change the heater core, you might try this. And I've seen it work. If I believe one of them's called Lime Away, I've used Lime Away, and you could put hoses going into the heater core, take off the regular hoses, put hoses in, and fill it up with lime away and let it soak there for like an hour or two and then flush it all out to get it all out of the system. Sometimes that can take enough of the chemicals off that the heater will be usable then. You might give it a try. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.